Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the virtual summit on distributed energy systems um, for workforce development, um, sponsored by Santa Fe Community College, EPSCOR, and um, with partnerships with our Economic Development Administration. I am absolutely grateful to have you all here today. Well, just a, a reflection on yesterday's um, conversation, we heard a little bit about policy. We heard a lot about policy, some of those things that are in the pipeline for making renewables um, more available of work for getting microgrid systems uh, evaluated in the state of New Mexico and ways that we can uh, better work together on our uh, workforce development through workforce solutions. So we heard from Secretary McCamley and um, we had a great welcome from our um, Economic Development Administration, Jorge Ayala, or George Ayala. Um, I'm absolutely grateful to have you here today. The next slide, and today we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to have a conversation, if we can um, look at that. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with uh, Selena and Olga, who are going to talk to us about the New Mexico Smart Grid Center. We will have a welcome from Jessica Falk from the Economic Development Administration, um, who have made the infrastructure possible for the training center. And then we're going to hear from Frank Curry. We're going to look a lot. We're going to look at a lot of our infrastructure at the college. We'll be looking at our systems, our curriculum, what the nano grid does for us. And I hope that you will all be thinking of ways that we can deploy these assets. Um, to support your initiatives statewide, either um, as workforce, if you're an industry partner, if you are um, with our local 611 and you work to train and qualify um, employees, how can we support that with our apprenticeship um, partnerships? And um, looking at how the big picture sort of plays itself out to better diffuse and make our microgrid, our smart grid systems are more accessible um, statewide. And then we'll take a break. There will be a number of opportunities for you to communicate real time um, as we did yesterday. So be prepared to participate in, in surveys and the likes when they come up. And then after our break, we're going to hear from uh, ESAM TAC, the Energy Storage Microgrid Training and Certification from Andrew Mackey, who will be joining us from the East Coast, and then we'll have a quick wrap up of our day. So I will now at this point, hand the conversation over to Selena Connelly, who is um, one of our outreach managers with the EPSCOR State Office, an absolutely wonderful person to work with. Selena, thank you for working with us. She's also one half of the technical brains and how this is all, um, working together. Uh, you'll see videos and Selena is really our, our expert in that area. So thank you so much, Selena. It's wonderful to work with you and we'll hand this over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Camilla. And I would like to recognize my EPSCOR colleagues who are also uh, contributing to this. So my partner in crime is Brittany Vanderwerf and I'm not sure you'll see her today, but she's definitely running the, the things behind the screen. But I'd also like to recognize our project director, Bill Mishner, the associate director, Ann Jekyll. And yesterday we had a number of EPSCOR staff as moderators, Isis Serna, Andra Kiskaden, Sarah, and Sarah Pouchet, along with Ann Jekyll. So we're so pleased to be partnering with the Santa Fe Community College to build workforce capacity for distributed energy systems. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about the New Mexico Smart Grid Center, a project of New Mexico EPSCOR. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to tell you that EPSCOR stands for Established Program to Stimulate Competitive Research. Don't blame us. That's a National Science Foundation acronym. The New Mexico Smart Grid Center is a five-year project funded through the National Science Foundation that establishes an interdisciplinary research center to address the design, operational, data, and security challenges of next generation electric power management. Specifically, our project is investigating how we can transform existing electricity distribution feeders into interconnected distribution feeder microgrids. This image is a model of a distribution feeder microgrid and how it can be both connected to and islanded from the electrical grid. 
On the left is the large scale generation. We heard a lot about that from our speakers yesterday with traditional power generation and utility scale renewables. And on the right is a schematic of all the elements of a distribution feeder microgrid. The Smart Grid Center is organized around four research goals, architecture, networking, decision support, and deployment. You'll see the goal described on the right side of the slide. And we have dedicated research groups, including both faculty and students working on those goals. Supporting the research groups are the cyber infrastructure resources, including data management and high performance computing. And finally, at the top is our human infrastructure, representing all the programs and resources to strengthen education, outreach, and workforce development. And this is where the work with Santa Fe Community College fits. The Smart Grid Center is, uh, is a collaborative effort with many partners, including three research, three research universities, New Mexico State, New Mexico Tech, and UNM, Santa Fe Community College, our two national laboratories, Sandia and, and Los Alamos, the Explorer Museum, Microgrid Systems Laboratory, and nine industry partners, which are pictured on the bottom. We heard from many of our industry partners yesterday as part of the industry panel, and they provide uh, advice to our Smart Grid Center and also participate in a number of activities. But when it comes down to it, the Smart Grid Center is really made up of people from across New Mexico. I want to point out that Camila Bustamante with her kilowatt smile is located right in the center of this photo wearing a white jacket. This picture was taken during our last in-person gathering of the Smart Grid Center during our all hands meeting in 2019. And we hope to be able to be back together in person sometime soon. Earlier, I mentioned the human infrastructure of the Smart Grid Center. Workforce development encompasses activities and training that prepare people for jobs. Our programs support people in academia, <clears throat> for faculty, postdocs, and STEM students. They prepare scientists to use computing power in their research. And of course, they support training for grid professionals through programs at Santa Fe Community College. Later in the program, Frank is gonna share all of the exciting things that are happening at SFCC. We also have a robust suite of outreach programs through our partner Explora, a hands-on science museum based here in Albuquerque, but with a reach throughout the whole state. Our outreach programs provide opportunities for the public to engage with smart grid topics and to inspire the next generation of smart grid professionals and research. I'm going to finish with a list of New Mexico Smart Grid programs and opportunities that are available to you, to your students, and in some cases, the general public. I don't have time to go through this whole list in detail, but if any of these sound interesting, please visit our website and sign up for our monthly newsletter. You can find our URL at the bottom of the slide. I'd also like to point out that Santa Fe Community College has, was a recipient of a $50,000 seed award, and Frank will describe more about how that money is being used there. So that sums up my, my uh, overview of the New Mexico Smart Grid Center. And next, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Olga Lavrova, who's one of the researchers in the New Mexico Smart Grid Center. Olga serves on our technical team and was recently recognized with our excellent mentor award. She's an associate professor in power systems and renewable energy integration at New Mexico State University. Previously, she held positions at Sandia, Sandia National Labs and the University of New Mexico. Welcome, Olga. Frank Curry is gonna join us to talk with Olga about research pathways. Good morning. Good morning, Olga. Thank you for coming. Good morning. I had the pleasure of working with you at, working with you at Sandia for a little while before you went to New Mexico State. Um, uh, so the, the program that I'm working on is, you know, at the community college, has a lot, we've heard in the last uh, day, uh, people talking about certifications and badges and trying to move into like, you know, technician kinds of roles. But there's also, um, we're, we're trying to build a program that is going to stimulate people to move into four year and beyond um, 
kinds of uh, you know career paths, educational paths. And so um, you know, I guess the 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 thing that I would like to hear from you uh, talk about this morning is you know one is the, the general gaps in the in, in the in knowledge distributed energy and smart grid space. Uh, what are the research opportunities there? And then more specifically, talk about the the um, the the research that is going on under under this project and in, in, in let people know a little bit a little more detailed some of the exciting things that, that are going on in research beyond the community college level. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I if I may, if I could share the screen, I have a short presentation. So I will jump over and I will share my PowerPoint. I hope you can see my screen with my PowerPoint. Yep. So uh, this is the introductory, introductory slide that I always start my classes with. And I always tell everybody that in our classes and in my classes, we will learn about those things that you should not attempt at home, like this one depicted here. So, um, but just to start and give everybody a little bit of an introduction, um, NMSU is a land grant uh, Hispanic serving and minority serving institution. We have a very large student body, something like 16,000, 15,000, 20,000, I don't know, I lost count, um, uh, across all of our colleges. So we are in College of Engineering, obviously, but there are other colleges that you might be, or students might be interested in. Um, clearly, as a New Mexico State um, higher ed institution, we do support lottery scholarships, and we also have lots of other opportunities for getting your degree funded through different um, uh, stipends, scholarships, um, grants, and awards. So as I mentioned, uh, we are in uh, Klipsch School of Electrical Engineering. We award, we basically have education starting from um, undergraduate universities to masters to PhD. And also we have um, professional certificate awards. So this is great for professionals who may already be working in industry, in um, electric utility, or looking to switch to a different area of work. But I'm not quite sure if the whole graduate school is completely for them. So they can go back and um, get some additional classes, take additional classes, get interesting research experience, and get a certificate degree um, in a new area. And so specifically for our area, uh, we have our electric utility management program, which is funded by core members of New Mexico State um, Electric Utility Group, which is PNM, El Paso Electric, um, New Mexico Electric uh, Co-ops, and a um, couple of our neighbors, including Arizona Publ Public Service. So for this particular program, this is the program that intended to prepare students and professionals to be actually in the upper management uh, for running power systems companies, whether they are public utility companies or uh, startups working on microgrids, startups working on interesting technologies in um, electric power and so on. And so there is normally a master's degree fellowship, which pays for basically all of the um, Tu uh, tuition and pays a small stipend for students who are funded by this electric utilities. So normally uh, the expectation is that you will be working on a research topic relevant to one of those um, companies, but there is no expectation that you will actually commit your life to working for them, although of course they always look for great hires. Um, in terms of our teaching and research infrastructure, we have a couple of pictures on um, on the right showing uh, some of our infrastructure in our teaching lab. Um, our teaching lab consists um, and sponsored by electric power, uh, electric, um, uh, electric power systems, um, consists of a lot of hands-on equipment starting from basically small low voltage uh, equipment like 24 volts, 48 volts, uh, all the way to real life equipment that we treat with great care. Um, with basically 120 volts um, coming in, uh, some of the DC power coming in from our rooftop PV array. We have some of the interconnection with actual three-phase systems, so students get to practice a lot of three-phase system work. This is something that we noticed that is not is is undertaught in uh, this day and age because um, it's actually 
fairly challenging to teach three-phase power applications. And on the right, in the far right, um, the figure that is kind of at an angle, this is our mock microgrid system consisting of multiple nodes where students can prototype different control algorithms, for example, for one of the households running one or another type of uh, smart inverter, one or another type of smart control system, and basically see how this will work in the big picture, in the big grid, and see if it doesn't destabilize or damage the big system in any ways. Additionally, when uh, students are ready for real big scale research, we have our off-campus uh, microgrid, which is called Southwest Technology Development Institute, that consists of this little mini village of several houses that can all operate individually or can operate as a microgrid. And what's very interesting is on um, this upper right figure, I don't know if you see my mouse, um, we have um, infrastructure that allows us to be completely islanded from El Paso Electric. So therefore we can do a lot of interesting, very interesting research here on individual units that would not normally be possible when we are connected to the grid, just for the safety and stability reasons. So there are lots of interesting research topics that we are working on there. And as I mentioned, there are lots of opportunities for students. Uh, here's a picture of one of our students working on a generator synchronization lab and basically teaching students how to do generator synchronization. We have students who are going to conferences, presenting their research work. Um, I torture students with lots of um, individual research presentations uh, that they later practice at their real conferences. And what's very exciting, we also have a new cybersecurity program at NMSU that has just been um, actually accredited. So it's an accredited bachelor's in cybersecurity degree. Uh, and of course, this can lead later to master's and PhD work. So this is very, very applicable to all of the work that we do in smart grid and microgrids. And uh, finally, just to go over a little bit of uh, the actual research topics. Uh, we cover all of the topics uh, that are relevant to our systems, such as generation that uh, we have heard about yesterday and probably will hear about today. So generation including traditional generation, um, all the way from coal to nuclear fired plants, uh, but also obviously a lot of renewables. Uh, we're looking at the big picture, such as power system stability, how all of the power systems operate across um, North American continent and even between continents. We are looking at power electronics that are applicable to electric vehicles. Uh, we are looking at power at cybersecurity, as I mentioned, um, energy storage, which is now a very, very important area of research. And so if you think about power systems that are around us, I quickly went over the power grid and we talked about that uh, yesterday and Selena presented a, a different picture overview of our power systems. But so we're looking at all of the components. So for example, we're looking at transformers, how the new modern transformers work. Um, some of them are already solid state uh, transformers that are really, really advanced. We're looking at uh, solar PV and how we can make sure that PV systems are operating at their best performance, including some things like where you have to monitor PV arrays with um, drones and communicate that information. We're looking at very, very nitty gritty power systems and power electronics, specifically what are the insides of all of this electronics. And we're looking at other big pictures such as applications of power electronics to electric vehicles, satellites, um, cell phones and all of the electronics around us. So I'll stop here. Um, my contact information is here. Um, my group is required to take mandatory selfies with me every semester. So if you come and join us in our group, then you will be required to take selfies with me. So I'll stop here and I'll hand this off to Frank. I'll stop sharing. All right. Well, thank you for that presentation, Olga. It's, um, sure. It all looks very exciting. Something that um, I came across recently was uh, that if Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison were both teleported into the modern time, that Alexander Graham Bell would have no concept of what was going on with, the, with modern communications technology. He, would, he wouldn't even recognize a phone to be a phone, 
but it, but Thomas Edison would look at our power system in, in, in 2020 and say, yep, I know what that's doing and I know what that's doing and I know what that's doing. So like one of the things that jumped out at me is this concept of a solid state transformer, just something that he might look at and say, what is that? And so I think it's really cool the, um, the, the opportunities and the way we're beginning to actually modernize and, and change this grid and, and, and turn it into something um, that it just, it hasn't continued to be for the last 120, 130 years. So um, thank you very much for that. I think it's time to turn this back over to Camilla to move us along. And thank you for coming and speaking with us today. Thank you both very, very much. Thank you for being here, Olga. It's wonderful to see you. Um, the next person that I'm going to introduce is Jessica Falk, who is currently the Senior Program Officer with the Economic Development Administration, Austin Regional Office, where she oversees Regional Office's University Center Program and the Economic Development District Programs. She also oversees the Regional Office's disaster recovery responses to Hurricanes Ike, Gustav, Dolly, and the Midwest floods, floods excuse me, for which she was awarded the Department of Commerce's Gold Medal Award. I have to say that I have been honored to know Jessica now. I realize that it's been even just a little bit over 10 years since I've been working with Jessica. Um, and I'm very grateful for her oversight, for the work that they do with the Economic Development Administration in supporting many of the projects that we have here in New Mexico, which is part of our Region 6 area. So um, without further ado, I'd like to invite Jessica to turn on her camera and welcome her to our conference and introduce um, Frank Curry, who is now able to work with us through the EPSCOR um, grant on the equipment that has been supported by the Economic Development Administration. So thank you so much, um, Jessica, for being here. Grateful and happy to see you. Well, good morning. Um, I am very honored to be able to attend this uh, um, summit and welcome you all. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Economic Development Administration and why this um, Santa Fe Community College program is so exciting to us. Um, the Economic Development Administration strives to make strategic investments to job, drive job growth, innovation, and long-term economic gain. And we look to partner with organizations um, to fund projects that are very forward-looking and it, that are going to result in jobs. But we're not looking for just any jobs. Jobs that will provide employment opportunities and professional growth. So we're looking for jobs that are going to provide employment opportunities in long, for the long term. Um, so when the Santa Fe Community College approached EDA to purchase this uh, equipment and microgrid energy assets, it was not the equipment that got us excited. It was the vision behind it and the partnerships. The vision of having state-of-the-art, hands-on training for workers and building automation systems and, microgrid, and microgrids. Training that would allow people to find jobs in growing industries and provide pathways for continual and personal growth for those workers. Um, but of course, we're the government and we don't just invest in a, vis in a vision. Um, this vision had support, and in particular, the partnerships that included private entities, governments, and educational entities that showed us that this vision was something that could really come into reality. And so on the basis of this well-supported vision, in 2017, EDA vested a little over $350,000 to purchase the equipment to support the, well -tra the, the training center. Um, if you look at EDA's website, you'll find EDA's mission to lead the federal economic development agenda by promoting innovation and competitiveness, preparing America's region for growth and success in the worldwide economy. This partnership with EDA at Santa Fe Community College really brings meaning to those words. It means helping real people get real jobs and to achieve success for them for their families and for the communities. Um, as such, I'm pleased to turn it back over to Frank Curry to discuss the innovative microgrid training center at Santa Fe Community College. Um, Y'all met Frank yesterday and you've heard from him a little bit today. Um, he is now going to discuss how the vision that inspired the EDA investment is going to come into reality as he spearheads the development of the training center. Mr. Curry, I'm very excited to hear about how the smart grid and microgrid systems technician training is becoming a reality. 
Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. So yeah, yesterday we talked about some of the um, the, the need for an, a workforce with new skills. Olga just talked about research pathways and Jessica talked about the, the kinds of jobs that we're trying to move toward. And so today I'm going to spend a little more time uh, looking at how SFCC is trying to lay the groundwork to prepare people to move into these kinds of technician jobs, these good jobs uh, in, in, uh, in smart grids, microgrids, distributed energy. We're gonna talk about those terms just a little bit, um, but we're also with the programs that we're building, trying to build um, programs that prepare students to, to get excited about transferring to institutions like NMSU and working with, um, with you know, uh, top-notch researchers like Olga Lavrova and others, um, and, you know, and generally try to move people into uh, getting excited about careers in, in, uh, in energy and engineering. Um, so I'll be presenting the programs and the infrastructure that we're developing here at the college um, to help create the foundations for people to enter into this space. Uh, and so we spent uh, in the last two days, there's been a lot of talk around um, smart grids, microgrids, distributed energy. And so I just want to stop for a minute and um, at least give uh, high level definitions of, of those terms so that, uh, so that we've got common definitions as we move forward. Um, smart grids are essentially just a combination. I say just, but I, um, it's a great big just. A combination of information and communication technologies coupled with new energy technologies. So, and there, you know, people may have heard about the, you know, terms like the internet of things. And so uh, smart grid is basically the internet of things dropped onto um, traditional technologies and, and evolving modern technologies. As we talked about earlier, Olga brought up things like solid state transformers, just new interesting technologies. Um, and so, uh, I'm losing my place here. Um, and so, you know, smart grids uh, will take it take into account everything from weather to load profiles. What's on now? What do we think is going to be on in 15 minutes? What's going to be on in an hour or a day? Um, and then uh, and adapt the way the system runs according to uh, forward projections. Um, smart grids can look at things like uh, real time energy costs so that resources can be dispatched intelligently to minimize the total cost to operate the system over time. Um, and then if we further imagine a world in which costs of things are calculated according to the two crop, excuse me, true cost to the health of the, the planet and its inhabitants, people, you know, things like us, um, then we can use these smart systems to begin to finally create a truly sustainable energy system. Um, so that's the smart. Uh, distributed energy is really just what the name implies, uh, you know, as opposed to the huge traditional uh, generating stations that Abbas talked about yesterday. Um, where we move power between regions, between states. Distributed energy systems are smaller um, and they put the, the energy sources where we have the loads. And so we can begin to move away from the, the big central concept and, and large power lines and transmission lines. We'll, we'll always probably still need those, but, um, but distributed starts to put the energy where the loads are. Um, that, that's the key thing about it. And then uh, another term that comes up is a microgrid. And while you know, microgrids are um, they're collections of distributed energy resources that are, you know, basically contiguous collections. They're connected together so that they can be operated either in conjunction with the system that they're connected to, or they can be islanded from that system so that they can, uh, so that they can provide energy no matter what's going on with the transmission and the energy system around them. So things like, you know, earthquakes or or, um, you know, more recently, a, a, a great example is you know, hurricanes in the southeast and, uh, in, and uh, you know, one of our, our biggest stories with hurricanes is, um, is Puerto Rico. So at this point, I'd like to back up for a moment and give you, begin to give you a short tour of uh, the SFCC nano grid. So a nano, our nano grid is basically, um, it's the greenhouse, it's what the EDA um, built that Jessica talked about. And it's, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how it fits into a broader project uh, here at, at Santa Fe Community College, but um, I'm going to start with the nano grid. And so, uh, Selena, if you could play our section one video for us.
Hi, welcome to the New Mexico EPSCoR Smart Grid Training Center Workforce Development Summit 2020. My name is Frank Curry. I'm lead faculty here at the College for Distributed Energy Technologies. And for the next half hour, I'll be taking you on a tour of the systems and the programs here at the college. Behind me is approximately 12 kilowatt photovoltaic array. It's the primary energy source for the nanogrid. Under normal circumstances, the sun would be shining and this array would be tracking with the sun and putting energy uh, either into the loads of the greenhouse or excess energy will, will be being stored by our energy storage system, which we're gonna visit in a few minutes. We also have the capability through our photovoltaic installation uh, program that Zuby Wilson runs to have students move those panels around so that they can see how the angle of the, the panels and the incident uh, angles of the sun affect output on the panel so they can understand how that operates. Um, as you can see right now, there's not a lot of sun going on even though it's New Mexico. And so under conditions like this, the array is putting out very little, but we um, will have the energy storage system that can back that up when we're in island mode. Otherwise, we've got the grid itself that'll feed it when we're in, uh, in grid connected mode. Well, hi, I'm Zuby Wilson. I'm the coordinator for renewable energy programs here at Santa Fe Community College. And I am the lead faculty for the solar and water conservation programs. But today we're talking about solar and particularly solar's involvement in what we have that's called a nano grid here. The college is going to be a micro grid. A nano grid is a micro grid within a micro grid. So the entire college is going to be an islandable micro grid, which means we can potentially export power when we have a surplus, import power when we don't have enough, or separate ourselves from the grid and operate as our own independent grid. The same is going to be true for our greenhouse over here, on a, which is the nano grid, which is a microgrid within the microgrid. So behind me we have this solar array, and it is producing power that either powers what is going on in the greenhouse or charges a battery that allows us to still use the solar electricity at night. So again, the greenhouse can either produce power when we're producing more than we, want, we need from the array, which happens every day. It also has a surplus that can either go to charge the battery to run it at night, or when the battery is full and we satisfied the loads, we can export that power into the larger campus. Of course, the larger campus has a gigantic one and a half megawatt array behind me over there and that produces more power than the college needs during the day so the college is also exporting power these are called inverters they convert direct current electricity into alternating current electricity photovoltaic arrays produce direct current what we use in our homes and businesses is alternating current all of this equipment then converts to alternating current and we can monitor from this meter how much is being produced each day. And we can do data recording on that. As a matter of fact, in my classrooms, my students can track that data live in the classroom and see what's going on instantaneously and historically. There's actually a computer screen in the hallway that anytime a student wants to, they can go with a touch screen and see how much is being produced right now, how much was produced today, and really see like, oh, look, a cloud went over. 10 minutes ago and look what the effect that had. And they can look at it in many graph forms. So Santa Fe Community College has, has a solar program since 2003, and it was encouraged to do that by the city as part of our academic development uh, package. So students can get a certificate in solar in one calendar year. And it goes all the way through from introduction to solar, introduction to photovoltaics, advanced photovoltaics, solar thermal, advanced solar thermal, and then a series of lab classes they take. There are also a number of other classes that you take, introduction to sustainability, a lot of interesting classes about electricity, national electric code. It's a really excellent program, and we have very high job placement. If you are a talented person, and you are a good employee, which is something the employers are looking for, our program will prepare you for an entry-level job, mostly installing solar, but I have some students that sell it 
some students that work in warehouses, and some students who actually do design work. Again, I'm Zuby Wilson from Santa Fe Community College, the coordinator for renewable energy programs. I wanna thank you for your time and I hope I was able to give you a little more information about the nano grid and how our solar program fits into it. So appreciate your time and I hope you're having a great conference. There we go. All right, thank you, Zuby. So Zuby talked about the nanogrid is part of a larger vision at, um, at Santa Fe Community College to create a campus-wide uh, microgrid. We're doing that in partnership with Siemens, um, who is, is uh, who has done the planning for the microgrid system and is, and is putting the equipment in. Um, and and uh, where am I? And so, you know, the idea is that under normal operating conditions, uh, the nanogrid resources will be controlled by the central uh, controller that will be running the entire microgrid for the school, um, including the one and a half megawatt array that uh, Zuby talked about, um, and also a megawatt and a half of, uh, of battery storage. But we're also going to be able to, to island the nano grid for uh, teaching um, and research purposes. So all these systems that you've just seen, um, the microgrid and the nested nano grid will be the, um, basically comprise the physical uh, distributed energy assets of the smart grid training center. Um, and they also come with some exciting training assets um, from Siemens. One of the most uh, exciting ones is uh, a pair of training simulators that will be looking in real time at the campus microgrid controller so that students will be able to work and learn in the context of a real functioning microgrid, see what's happening um, and understand how it works, um, which will be uh, valuable experience for people moving on to the world. Um, and one of the things that came up to there was energy storage. And so now, um, as we'll see, the nanogrid also has energy storage in it, as I talked about in that first video. And so I want to uh, go ahead and kick into the second video where we're going to talk a little more about the energy storage in the nanogrid. So we talked a little bit about the photovoltaics, about the energy source, and a little bit about the, the concept that the, the sun isn't always shining, right? When you want it, sometimes that system's going to be able to put out more than you need. Sometimes it's not going to put out enough. And so one of the most critical components of an independent microgrid of nanogrid like this, if it's going to be islanded, is an energy storage system. Um, this energy storage system is really exciting for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that it was funded by the Department of Energy. So the Department of Energy funded that through the Sandia National Labs Energy Storage Demonstration Team, who uh, still works with us on things like getting sensors into the system um, so that they can track and do research and uh, and so they can watch its operation. And so the, the information, the data that's coming off the system as we run it in various modes through various experiments is actually being fed um, in near real time to Sandia National Labs to be used by the National Lab System. So that's really cool. Um, more Specifically, this energy storage system is a 100 kilowatt, 85 kilowatt hour system. And so basically, um, everyone's familiar with Teslas. Behind this door that says NEC on it are a bunch of modules of batteries that are basically a Tesla. Most Teslas, the base model is an 85 kilowatt hour system. And so this is kind of like a Tesla standing up. The 85 kilowatt hours is able to serve our nano grid our greenhouse uh, which is about a 10 kilowatt load right now so depending on the, the mode of operation and what we need to do um, it, it can serve its peak load for probably uh, you know less than eight hours six to eight hours um, and if we were able to scale back to the critical systems uh, in the in the greenhouse so the the pumps on the nft system the pumps on the dutch bucket system things that have shallow water so that they constantly need water flow so we always need those running no matter what if if one of those goes down for even half an hour to 45 minutes our plants will begin to die um, then it, once we've fed just a, that's just a couple of kilowatts of load once we've fed those we could stage in for example the, the the big cooling fans the exhaust fans that are on the greenhouse those run about a kilowatt each and we have eight of them so um 
so we could, we could begin to step those in there. And when the system is operating in an islanded mode, it'll be taking in or it'll, or compensating for energy from the photovoltaic system uh, to feed the loads in here. When the nano grid is being operated in uh, grid tied mode so that it's connected back to the school, we can actually dispatch this energy storage system against things like peak loads in the system to bring down bring down peak demand charges. Um, if we can time the discharge of this battery with the peak that goes on with the school, um, we can actually you know knock off hundreds of dollars um, a bill each month, uh, in some cases thousands of dollars. Um, this 100 kilowatts, I'm going to do a little quick math, 23, it's about $23 a kilowatt times 100. So it's about, if we can discharge this at full capacity while the peak is going on and shave the peak for the school, that, that's a couple of thousand dollars that comes off the bill every month just for turning on for the right five minutes. We've talked about the energy, the energy source for the nano grid, the photovoltaic system. We've got the energy storage system that can either compensate that or absorb energy from it. And um, these resources come together and are actually controlled through a central point um, that, we're, that we can go talk about right now. So the various distributed energy resources that we've seen so far, the photovoltaic system, the energy storage system, come together to serve our loads in here. Um, this is the main switch gear for, for this system. Uh, it, this is what allows us to island the system and separate it from the rest of the campus system. So there's a main breaker connecting us to the campus that we can open to turn this into an island. And then downstream of the island, inside the island, are, are the photovoltaic system, the energy storage system. We've got a bay for a generator system that's going to be coming in here soon, um, this, this coming semester. And once we've got our energy sources all mixed together, we need to feed them into the loads. And so everything comes through this big transformer right here. And the transformer then drops us to the 120 and the 2083 phase uh, that we need to feed Pedro systems uh, in the greenhouse. All right, I hope that was entertaining. Um, Frank, you're muted. Hi there. Sorry, here I am. Um, so yeah, that was our general overview of the nanogrid system um, at the college. And so now I wanna take a few minutes with this next video to put the nano grid into a little bit more of a, a human context and kind of and show you what we do with this nano grid, um, what makes working with some of the energy systems, distributed energy systems, um, it, you know, it, to me, um, kind of exciting and, and gives it meaning. The technical systems are great, but the reason we use systems like this is to support something, some critical load that we need. And so in this next video, we're going to introduce you to um, the interior and the heart and the life of, of the greenhouse, the, the, what the, the energy systems of the nano grid, what they, what they feed. So Selena, if you could kick us into Pedro in the greenhouse. Okay, welcome to SFCC. My name is Pedro Casas. I'm from Puerto Rico. Uh, I'm the greenhouse manager of this uh, incredible 12,000 square feet uh, greenhouse. Um, let me tell you a little bit of my story and how do I got here. Uh, the lead faculty at, at the SFCC college is Charlie Chultz, and he was my mentor, wow, 12 years ago when I started this uh, incredible uh, new business back home in Puerto Rico where I built a greenhouse on a commercial aquaponic farm. Um, sadly, two and a half years ago, the hurricane destroyed it, and Charlie called me because he needed a help here, and I was able to move here and start um, teaching and helping running this beautiful greenhouse. 
in this section that I'm showing here, that, I'm, that I have some of these systems behind me, it's our student area. This greenhouse is huge. We have it divided in different commercial and student sections. So right here, we're in the student area. So basically, they run these systems. We, we give them projects, so they manage the, the units. This is an aquaponic system. We got the fish here running some growing beds and some floating beds so they can cycle plants and they can run the whole process, water chemistry, feeding the fish, maintaining, cycling fish as they want to, so they can eat them. And they can also cycle their veggies so they can count and get numbers of what a, a family can do weekly if they build one of these systems in their backyard. Let me show you a little bit what we do here in the, in the aquaponic section. Uh, here at SFCC, one of the system, the recirculating system that we teach, it's aquaponic where we grow fish and plants together. Why we do that? It becomes an ecosystem. Fish produce the nutrients that we need for the plants. They do all their things in the water. We send all that water through the biological filters. And here in the biological filters, we convert most of that into the nutrients that the plants need. So over by the beds, all the water that is running under, it's high in nutrients because we convert it. And at the end of the process, plants clean that water so we can take that water back to our fish tanks so the fish tank will always have clean water and do that cycle back again we're going to talk about a very easy system to put together uh it looks complicated because this one is a commercial one but we call it an nft system it's a nutrient film technique it's a hydroponic system we mix the salts we have a big tank of water so it's our nutrient uh, receiver tank and we have a pump that pumps and send the water through these emitters to each of the channels so we can send the nutrient necessary for the plants. So it's a very simple system to manage. So we're gonna talk about the Dutch bucket system we have here at SFCC. It's one of those commercial units that we teach uh, our students how to manage. Uh, this is the injection wall that controls all the nutrients and the water flow that we send to each of the lines of these uh, buckets. The purpose of that is for us to be able to do cycles. Uh, so the cycles go, I plant this first row of tomatoes. Let's say we did it, I think we did it about a week ago. Two months later, we do another uh, set of tomatoes and we plant them. And then two months later, we do another set. And that way we can create incredible cycles year round. So even in winter time, when the weather outside is freezing, we have this uh, incredible greenhouse controlling the weather and we can keep producing tomatoes year round. We usually will have a, maybe a line or two that we're taking out or we're planting, but there's always at least three of my channels producing tomatoes constantly. This is a 500 square foot compared to our greenhouse that is a 12,000 square foot. This is where we started our curriculum. This is where CEA curriculum at, at SFCC started. And basically what we have here is almost the same things that we have over by the big greenhouse, but in a smaller version, just to show people that they can run any of these at home in a backyard small greenhouse. We have Dutch bucket system, we have aquaponic systems here, and we have an NFT system. The three main commercial systems that we show you guys in the 12,000 square foot greenhouse, we have them here in a way much more smaller version that anybody can manage. Thank you everybody for following me in this incredible SFCC tour. Um, I hope you all now understand what is, what is the things that we do here in, the, in our facilities, um, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, welcome, and I hope you guys come and visit whenever we can. Hi, my name is Natasha, and I'm a student at the Santa Fe Community College Controlled Environment Agriculture Program. So I chose this program because I'm passionate about food security, especially as the climate changes. I believe it's gonna become important to one, grow food as efficiently as possible using hydroponics or something that conserves resources, and two, to be able to grow food in whatever location and whatever climate. So controlled environment agriculture is a good way to learn to do that. Now we are harvesting lettuce from an NFT, which stands for Nutrient Film Technique System. It's a hydroponic system, uh, and this lettuce is ultimately going to be donated to hunger efforts for the local community. Since I started the program, I'd say I learned a lot about hydroponics and also just about uh, plants in general. Uh, 
so we study soil biology as well as soil lists, so I think that the skills that I've learned are applicable to a lot of fields. The program has really grown since I started. We kind of have been building the greenhouse as we go, so the NFT was not at full production until now. The, these two big aquaponic systems have ramped up, and there's a lot more students now as well than there used to be. The most important thing I've learned is just about resource management, um, how to conserve resources in a variety of different situations. For the effort that we're doing right now, we produce, uh, now that our tomatoes are fully going, we produce about 90 to 100 pounds of tomatoes a week. And in the NFT system, we produce 400 heads of lettuce a week. Anybody could get involved in this program. Uh, we even have people who have come from out of state to do this program. We've also got kind of sister to the aquaponics program, the algae cultivation program, which is also one of either the only or one of the only in the country at a community college level. So it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty special place. All right, so hope you enjoyed that. Um, uh, so the idea there was to, you know, kind of contextualize um, the, the, you know, efforts for microgrids. Um, we've, sorry, I'm losing my place here. Um, so, you know, in this case, we're using microgrids to do things like make sure that food is available to the community. And so we've been able to do that through, um, throughout a pandemic um, that, that, uh, greenhouse that Pedro just gave you a tour of is one of the primary foundations of our smart and microgrid training center. Um, and and uh, uh, another example um, is in Puerto Rico. Um, they have, uh, Pedro's from Puerto Rico. And when I just came out of Sandia National Labs yes, last year, um, my colleagues at, at Sandia um, were looking at using existing hydro generators in the mountainous uh, central municipalities. Um, there's hydro up there that's been neglected for decades. And we want to use it as the heart of resilient microgrids. So the, coupled with PV and energy storage, uh, the hydro generators will allow communities in the central region, communities that in Maria went in some cases for up to a year without power. Um, we want to be able to get them online in, you know, in weeks instead of months. And so a more extreme example uh, that's going on but uh, of, of microgrids and how microgrids create resilience. And so the idea here is that, you know, the, the, the greenhouse is this little microcosm that allows our students to operate in real time and, and, and see how something is, it really works and have an impact. So we're very excited about that. And we're very uh, proud also of our controlled environment agriculture um, uh, program. And so uh, we've got one more video for you that does a little bit of a, a wrap up. And so Selena, if you could do section four for us, please. Now we've seen the nano grid, we've seen some of the resources that we have in there. Um, we've talked about the program a little bit, but uh, you know, one of the coolest things about the nano grid, about distributed energy in general, is that a, a lot of the impetus for doing it at all is about resilience. It's about riding through things. It's about local resources and meeting local needs. And one of the, um, I, I don't know if it's necessarily fortuitous in a lot of ways, but one of the the most interesting things that has happened uh, through the beginning of the development of this program uh, is that we have a global pandemic. In March, when the school shut down, uh, Pedro and his people in the greenhouse were began growing food for multiple community groups. Um, there was food going to sheltered people, to at-risk people, um, and that in the in the greenhouse had to run. We had we also have a lot of construction going on on the campus right now, and so there have been power blips and fluctuations and things under normal circumstances could have interrupted uh, the flow of that greenhouse and its operation a lot more than they might have otherwise. Um, Part of the reason that we were able to ride through right now, because the nanogrid isn't fully functional yet, it's what we're working on, but it's interesting to see the parts that we theoretically knew we needed, but now really know that we needed. So we've got you know, a backup generator coming there that instead of having facilities bring in a generator when they need one and hope that it's gonna be hooked up correctly, um, we've, got, uh, we've got a bay for um, 
for people to put in research organizations to put in uh, distributed energy resources and see how they function and all of this gets to happen in the context of a real functioning microgrid that you know needs to keep running this isn't just uh, this isn't just a bunch of uh, lab equipment where you know you turn it off and go home at night and turn it on and run a few experiments this is a real system with that, that really serves our community it feeds our culinary kitchen to set, um, among other things there was the uh, uh, what's it called? the world central kitchen project that was supporting a lot of Santa Fe uh, throughout the throughout the, the pandemic and a lot of produce a lot of lettuce uh, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of tomatoes uh, came out of the greenhouse and went into the kitchen as well as going into other things around the community and so it's really cool that that, that when, as students come in here and we begin begin to put in the, the new generator the new bay um, get the energy storage system uh, finally online that the pandemic interrupted that so we weren't able to fully commission it but um, very soon we'll be able to get everything in place and students will be learning in the context of a real functioning system uh, with, with, with uh, critical functionality and so um, I think that's one of the most exciting things about it um, we've got uh, we've got uh, Sandia National Labs is in the process of outfitting sensors in our energy storage system so that we can test you know thermal gradients across the system among other things um, and I don't actually even know everything they're going to do in there because I'm going to leave it to uh, uh, all the really smart guys down at uh, Sandia to figure out what they're doing there but. Um, We've, so we've got Sandia coming in. We're, we're putting in a data acquisition system with Sandia so that they can see what's happening in the energy storage system and in the rest of the grid. So this isn't just students coming in and again, like I said, you know, just running like, you know, test bench things. This is students looking at a real system working in conjunction with National Lab and, and uh, 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 university level resources and collaborators to, to understand how, how nanogrids, how microgrids truly function and what needs to happen there so that when they go out into the world, they're going to have a real understanding of what's happening. I want to thank everybody for coming. I hope that this has been informative for all of you. I hope you had a good time with it. I hope you've learned something. As I step out of here into real time, I'll be available to answer any of your questions. So if you've got any questions, I'll, I'll see you in a couple of minutes. All right, so that has been, oh, sorry, forgot about this. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, we are very proud of what we're putting together here. Um, so, so far we have toured the physical facilities that we're developing here um, to give students and researchers hands-on real-time tools that will facilitate learning about modern smart grids. Um, but now I wanna move into some of the academic framework that we're building um, to try to provide the fundamental knowledge and skills that students will need to work in these, uh, in, in these systems. Um, are we ready for, I'm sorry, I've just seen the instructions. Um, yeah, so um, as I move through the rest of this, I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes talking about the program, um, uh, certificates and the classes that we're putting together. 
as you have questions um, from what has already come or what um, I'm about to talk about, please submit them uh, at any time through the Zoom Q&A. And then um, when I'm finished talking about the program, we'll circle back and get your questions. So um, as we've already talked about uh, today, uh, smart grids employ uh, areas of knowledge beyond traditional power engineering, um, areas like information technology, cybersecurity. Um, working with smart grids requires knowledge of safety, of codes, standards, um, it requires knowledge of distributed energy technologies, especially solar and energy storage technologies. Um, uh, and, but while uh, smart grids rely on knowledge that goes beyond traditional energy uh, knowledge, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we don't already have um, a lot of the foundational coursework already. Um, as we talked about yesterday a little bit with Abbas, he had mentioned that um, you know, we've got a system that's been here and we're trying to adapt it to a new paradigm. Um, and so as we started to build this program, we tried to focus um, to start with on existing knowledge and then figure out where we needed to uh, supplement to, to round things out. Um, um, and so, uh, sorry. And so what I'm gonna do now is get into the, um, the, uh, uh, the program. And so what you see up on the screen right now is uh, an overview of the uh, certificate in distributed energy technologies and systems. Um, the basic idea uh, here, I'll just, I'll go through the, the summary there, but success, successful completion of this student, of the certificate prepares the students to enter the transforming electrical power sector as a competent distributed energy systems technician. Um, so this one is focusing on the tech side. Um, we will then at some point um, over the next year, we'll be moving into putting together uh, associates level things that move people into, uh, into four year uh, and beyond uh, institutions. Um, so the basic idea is to, as we've talked about and people have expressed concern about for a program like this uh, yesterday and, and, and this morning, um, we want to make sure that this program lets people um, understand the, you know, uh, safety, construction safety is one of the things that came up yesterday. So we want to focus on safety. We want to foc focus on um, the technologies that go in. We want to make sure that um, codes and regulations, the students have been, um, have been exposed to those. And we want to make, make sure that students get the ability to actually uh, do some design. So can we move to the next slide, please? So what you'll see here is um, these are the courses that we have in our certificate right now. This is the initial certificate. Um, it will be evolving um, with industry uh, and academic input. But right now, um, a couple of the things I just want to highlight are one of the first courses that, that students have to take when they step into this program is um, our BLDG 111. And in, the, in, that, in that course, students get an OSHA 30 card. So they are um, immersed in, in safety. And in, in so they, they come out with actual uh, uh, credentials, uh, with OSHA credentials. Um, this program is, requires at least a little bit of math skills. We need students that move out to the workforce with the ability to navigate in math. Um, so uh, as our foundation right now, we've got uh, algebra and, uh, or excuse me, or statistics. We hit codes, we hit electronic fundamentals. Um, our PV system that, uh, excuse me, our PV program that Zuby talked about. And then one of the things that has come up, um, it was talked about yesterday by, uh, by a boss, Olga talked about it a fair amount today, is the, is the, um, the computer science component. The, uh, so every, we, right now what we have is computer networks um, in some basic um, hardware and software um, uh, skills that we get people in, but we're also going to be moving into cybersecurity um, and, and put those into into uh, into the program. And so, uh, and then we, um, once we put those courses together, that was our foundation that already existed. We realized that we needed to put a couple contextualizing courses together. And so, um, over the um, over the summer, we built uh, two courses that are now online. Uh, one is the uh, SUST 1120. It's an introduction to power systems, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, one is the introduction to smart grids, which I'm also going to talk a little bit more about. And then um, one of the things that is critical 
to making sure students are prepared isn't just to get a theoretical foundation, but to get them hands-on experience with these resources, with the nanogrid, with the microgrid, with the, you know, with the microgrid uh, simulators. And so we are, we've tried to create a couple of pathways depending how students want to move through this. And one of them is a capstone. Again, I will talk about that. Um, I'll be talking about all these for, for a minute. Um, and we also have uh, an internship. And for now, the way the certificate is set up is if somebody wants to, they could also take the, uh, um, the ISIS uh, information um, systems and computer science um, internship to meet the, the uh, requirements of the certificate. Can we move to the next slide? So um, one of the two courses that was created and put online this fall is, is we pushed that ship out to sea is an introduction to power systems. The base, I, I mostly included all the words so that when people go back and look at this, they can, they can, uh, they can see what's there. I don't wanna read all of it right now. Um, but the basic idea is to give students an introduction to the, to, to the power system. Again, as we've talked about, and Abbas brought this up, right? we've got an existing system and we need to figure out how to take this existing system and move it into the places that we need it to operate for the future. And so, you know, we introduce students to the history of the system. We, we talk about, um, you know, basic power system um, uh, knowledge, load generation, you know, real and reactive power, alternating direct currents, um, and then move through increasingly taking them into the system. So how the, how the, uh, the power system is operated, various time modes, you know, from really short, short duration things to, you know, to looking at the system operating over hours and days and weeks and years. Um, and so that's, uh, we think that's going to be a really cool course. Um, can we go to the next one? And then while the, the power systems course talks about the, the, the grid as it has been and as it is, and that's the course that's going to talk about, um, focus primarily on um, energy conversion and generation technologies um, uh, and, uh, and storage and that kind of thing. This ELAC 201 introduction to smart grids is going to get students more specifically into working with smart grids. This is where they'll be, um, well, they'll be working with the, uh, um, with the nano grid and with the, uh, and with the simulators. And so, you know, we, we talk about the, um, you know, the technical uh, design issues that go uh, into smart grids, talk about the economics because economics are a huge driver in the way our power system is operated historically and the way it will be operated as we move into the future. Somebody yesterday brought up um, making sure that we have um, data analysis. I think they brought up big data um, and big data is absolutely a huge part of, of smart grids in, in, move, in the grid moving forward. Um, and then finally, what we're doing is um, we've, we've uh, and I'm gonna talk more about the seed grant in a little bit, but we were, we won a seed grant that gave us money to get industry standard um, simulation software. And so we have purchased and we'll be using um, Homer Pro so that, uh, so that students can actually design and work in, in, in microgrid simulations. And Homer was initially developed, developed by National Renewable Energy Lab uh, in Sandia, and it has since been uh, transferred into the private sector. Um, but but uh, so this is an industry level um, uh, uh, software package that our students will be using to learn. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so yeah, the capstone, we, I talked about two, a couple of pathways, a couple of ways for students to try to uh, apply the knowledge that they're learning with the rest of this. And so the, the capstone, um, the high level of this is that I, I envisioned that being almost a competition based kind of a, um, a way of doing things. There are always through research, through uh, academia, there are you know, various kinds of uh, competitions, student competitions that go on design projects. And so uh, the general intent of this distributed energy capstone is to um, identify uh, various, you know, design competitions and, and have the students participate in them. And so they can practice, uh, they can practice skills um, from the technical skills to, to, to uh, project management and working in teams. Um, and so that, that's the general idea behind this one. And then the next one is the internship. And the internship um, is a little more specific to uh, trying to find employers for our students to work with um, and also working within our own uh, nanogrid and microgrids here, here on, on, the, um, 
on campus. And so this is, a, this is an opportunity for students to identify uh, research projects that might be, you know, that could be in conjunction with Sandia, that could be in conjunction perhaps with, excuse me, with a New Mexico State or UNM or something. And so, and so here we try to, you know, students are a little more individual. They're, in, they're either in a job or they're in, in, a, in a research pathway where they're trying to um, learn how to uh, conduct and present uh, research. Next slide, please. Um, this I just brought up for a moment um, because I, I stumbled across it this summer um, a few years ago, well, about five years ago, somebody put together um, in, our, in our SHEM, Science, Health, Engineering, and Math, um, an information technology support uh, for smart grids and microgrids. And so um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Selena. And so it was really cool because when we were first putting some, putting courses together, this is before I came on board here, um, Somebody had envisioned this and the idea basically, and I want to revive this, this is, which is why I'm putting it back up. I wanna work with uh, my Dean and, and, and uh, curriculum committee and revive this is it's, it's, it's basically an IT certificate, but we, um, the intent was to put in enough, um, enough uh, sustainability and distributed energy so that as students work through um, IT, through the IT certificate, they'll, they'll have, have a little bit of a context for where this might go. And the other reason I put this up is because um, you'll see in the, in the certificate that we already showed that we had the ISIS 114 and the ISIS 122 already in, um, but the other courses that I specifically, and we specifically want to um, begin to work in because of the um, cybersecurity aspect of, of smart grids are, are the uh, ISIS 171 and 273 courses. That are um, so we'll talk about computer security fundamentals um, and network defenses and countermeasures. So it's going to be exciting to put in um, to put some of the uh, computer science into this to to really make this a comprehensive program. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, okay, so one of the things that has happened since we began this program um, that is very very exciting. I talked about it a little bit in the videos. Um, is that in April we were awarded a $50,000 uh, seed grant uh, from EPSCoR. And so we had already, you know, the, the Smart Grid Center grant that, that funds my position in, the, in this curriculum development, that's already been ongoing since, um, since last fall. But with, the, with the, the seed grant, we're able to put in more equipment um, and software and um, and internships to take the, the 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 curriculum development, the academic side of it, and really begin to create a hands-on environment for students to apply the knowledge um, that they're going to learn. So go ahead and move to the next slide, please. And so um, I'll go really quickly over this, but uh, and so we're going to add equipment. Um, the pieces of equipment that were put into the proposal for the seed grant initially included um, a variable load bank so that we can kind of create our own load profiles. The, the greenhouse will be doing what it's doing, um, but we can also um, add, or sub, you know, add or subtract if they've already been added in the load bank. We can kind of, we can, we can kind of create our own load profiles um, and, and have uh, resources dispatch against those. Uh, I mentioned in one of the videos that we're going to be putting in a backup generator. And so the seed grant will be um, helping us purchase that backup generator. Um, and then the other aspect that I think is really cool is we are getting energy management, um, uh, energy monitoring and management equipment. And so um, students will be able out in one of the internships We'll have students out there working with me to, uh, you know, to put, uh, you know, potential transformers and sensors and stuff throughout throughout the nano grid, so that we can, um, so that we can feed back real time uh, energy data, so we, so that we truly know how the how the uh, the nano grid and is operating. And so I think that that hands on experience and you know, getting out there with sensors and then looking at, you know, controllers um, is going to be invaluable to our students as they move forward. Okay, next slide. Um, and then the other, so that was the, that's the equipment that's coming in um, because of the seed grant. The seed grant also funded some software that I'm really excited about. So the, um, the introduction to power systems course is now using um, something called the Power World Simulator. It's, a, it's an industry standard uh, 
software package for power system simulation. And so students will be building actual models with generators and loads and balancing loads across balancing areas and understanding how, how, how power is moved through the system. They'll be able to experiment with putting in energy storage systems and, 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 uh, and see how that uh, balances together. And as I already talked about a little bit for the microgrid, uh, smart grid course, we're getting Homer, um, which is a, a, a nationally used microgrid design tool. And so um, same thing, students are going to take the things that they learn in their classes and they're going to apply them to actual modeling. And so they're, so they're going to get real modeling hands-on skills, uh, understanding how, how this goes together. So go ahead, next slide. And so I think that, um, do we have anything in the Q&A? That's where we said to put things, right? Yeah. So we've got, oh. We've got time to do Q&A, so please, folks, go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box, and Frank will uh, entertain your questions. Here we go. Could you describe a bit more detail how the collaboration between SFCC and Sandia National Labs works? Uh, what are the goals for the research on the greenhouse nanogrid is more info available online somewhere in this effort. Um, the, the collaboration between uh, SFCC and, and uh, Sandia National Labs is right now is largely based around that energy storage system. Sandia uh, always wants information coming back from, from energy storage systems that are out in the world. Um, we are specifically right now working with the uh, demonstrations team, the energy storage demonstrations team, um, who has projects across the country, um, and in some cases outside the continental United States, um, to bring back real-time data and become this repository of information in real-time systems so that researchers can look at how systems operate and, and understand how, you know, where, where the gaps are and what we need to, to do to do things differently. And so one of the major goals for them is just to get real-time data coming back from real, from real operating systems. Uh, one of the other things that uh, Sandia has talked about wanting to do is, as I said, um, there are sensors that I, I, I'm not completely up on the project, but there are sensors being built into the battery system so that we can get some, so that Sandia can get real data back from, from systems and, and, and start to understand how energy storage systems operate in various, you know, you know in various climates and in, in various circumstances. And so I can get more information um, about that for somebody who's interested if they want to email me after. Um, do you think these programs are unique Oh, that just moved um, nationally. If so, are there plans to try to recruit students from outside of New Mexico? Uh, in the research that I've done so far, I think that the program is unique. It, it, we, we know that there um, are some other programs that deal with various aspects of it, and it is our goal to work with these programs to try to, to make sure that we're, you know, the gaps are being filled where they, where they need to be filled. But um, I think that it, I think that this this program is unique um, it, it, the way it's being structured right now and how we're trying to move forward. I think it's unique in the fact that it is working within um, an amazing uh, research collaborative that includes multiple higher education institutions and national laboratories. And in, in, uh, in one of the uh, I guess one of the consequences of of a you know of a pandemic is that we were already planning on moving a lot of this online, but we are forced to now that for this next year, everything is online. We're, under, we're, we're learning how to, how to deliver the labs online. We're learning how to do all of this online. And so I think that it absolutely is something that we could do to, uh, um, the recruiting students from outside of New Mexico is something that can happen, particularly um, in, in a more virtual world. Um, what do we got here, Clay Doyle. Are, you, are or will any of these courses be available online? I think, okay, yeah, we just talked about that. They are. Um, this semester has already started, so I think it's too late for that. But beginning in the spring, I believe the same courses will be available. And um, we also are going to have the, um, the certificate and the Associate of Applied Science and an Associate of Science um, run through our curriculum committee over the next couple of months so that people can declare these as 
as their pathway, for whether it's a certificate or an AS. Um, and so I hope that answers that. What do we got here? Megan, uh, what other partners who, who are, sorry, going a little dyslexic, who are other partners we should be working with to create internships and apprenticeships? Well, <laughs> that's one of the points of this, of this summit is to put outreach or, you know, tell people what we're doing and get feedback to figure out where we can create um, new partnerships. With respect to internships, um, we're creating the, the internship program or the internship courses. Um, that was the first step, arguably the first step. Um, beyond that, it will be um, we, I, other people, um, anyone who has any ideas, we, we can be working actively to identify places for people to go. I mean, everything from, from uh, solar installers to energy storage installers to we're hoping people, you know, move into uh, the national lab um, setting as, as technicians to help, to help with, um, you know, energy storage and distributed energy systems as lab techs and that kind of a thing. So we are actively working on identifying partners, um, you know, say, as I've already talked about a number of times now, you know, like Sandia is, is one, um, and we've got some, you know, the, the local PV installers that are, are, the, are the more low-hanging fruit, but we're, we're trying to develop those partnerships as we move forward. We're, we're still in the first few months of the program. Um, John, have you been looking at combined heat and power for use in district energy systems? Um, the concept of combined heat and power will be coming up. Um, our microgrid, campus microgrid, uh, is actually going to be including generation and some CHP type things. As we bring those online, we will figure out how to um, integrate them into the program so that students can get practical application, uh, practical hands-on experience with them. Um, we, you know, we've retired, we had a, a biomass boiler, but we've retired that, so. Um, the, the CHP aspect, I would be very interested in learning, um, talking to people about um, the idea of how to integrate that. Um, right now, right now I'm primarily looking at um, distributed energy sources. Um, I'm gonna say traditional, but traditional in a modern sense, um, meaning um, you know, like PV and energy storage in, 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 the, in the smart side of the technologies. CHP is absolutely going to be part of um, the modernized grid moving forward and um, all I can say right now is that we will be doing our best to hear what's going on out there, look at what's going on, and integrate it into the program. Um, and Olga tells me that NMSU's classes are also available online, so that is a wonderful thing to know. Um, so that you know, as we work with NMSU, UNM, uh, New Mexico Tech, the idea is to create these programs, especially the AS, as it comes together, so that so that someone like Olga, or an institution like NMSU, can take the two years that somebody did in our distributed energy associate, uh, yeah, associates, um, and just and just step right into a, a program with with Olga and NMSU or, or somewhere else. Frank, I have a question. This is Camilla. Hi. Hi. Um, so, how will SFCC work with the uh, industry advisory committees and include the IBEW and the industry to inform curriculum? So how are we going to align our curriculum to ensure that the program supports our industry? And we, the I, um, I, I think the answer that I have to that right now, um, and you, you probably, Camilla, have a, have a more precise answer. But as we put this together, the intent was to build on what we had and get a program that kind of could hit the ground running. It is, so the, the certificate um, courses, that certificate that, that we've seen so far a little bit ago in these courses, they're, they're just the beginning. This is a, this is a, this is a four-year program um, developing this. And so my, my focus when, when I stepped in was to say, what can we do to most expediently put something that has value to, um, to industry and to academia for our students? You know, how can we put something together that they can work on now? And then forums like this and conversations with people like Bernie um, um, and I'm going to forget um, local 611 I believe was 
but I forgot his name. Um, we'll, we will continue to talk to these talk to these people and make sure that the programs we're putting together uh, support their needs. Uh, one of the things that's going to be talked about this afternoon is ESAMTAC, the Energy Storage and Microgrid uh, uh, Training. What's the C in that one, Camilla? Um, but so so the conversation is happening and will continue to happen. Uh, the certificate in the classes so far were about making sure that we could get something on the ground that was meaningful, but it is by no means done. That's what the next three years are for is to, you know, it's ready, fire, aim. We're, we're going to, we're going to be working from here to make sure that what we're doing aligns. Uh, and we, and we have an advisory panel um, that is likely to morph, change, grow over the next few years to make sure that what we're putting together meets industry and academic needs. Excellent. Thank you. So I think we've hit our time um, for me. Yes, that's right, Frank. Is there anything else you want to finish with? I don't think so. I guess other than, um, oh, yeah, there are a couple of things. One, I'm really excited about this program. And then two is um, one, of the, one of the people who is responsible for so much of what you saw in those videos, um, much of the greenhouse, um, our, our biofuels program, our innovation center, uh, Luke Spangenberg um, passed away this past weekend. Um, I, I, Luke has been a friend and a colleague of mine for a long time, and I just, um, and many of you on here may know him because he, he's just, he's, he's basically a superstar in sustainability. And so I just, um, it, it makes me sad that Luke wasn't able to see, he, he's been behind the scenes in little parts of, of putting this, um, you know, the videos in particular together, but the programs at Santa Fe Community College, he's been integral to and much of it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for him. And so um, I, am, am, I, I just, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lose my train of thought, I apologize. I just, I just wanna thank Luke and honor Luke and all the work that he's done to put this, this foundation together uh, to help us move forward into the future. And I'm excited to honor his memory by, by putting together a program that he would be proud of. And I, and I will strive to put at least a fraction of the energy that Luke put into building and community outreach and, and, and just his amazing personality and, and being a champion of sustainability. I will, I will do my best to put at least a, a small piece of that energy into myself and, 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 and try to carry forward at least a small part of his torch. And so I'd just like to say um, goodbye to Luke. Thank you, Frank. It, it is uh, condolences from all of us at New Mexico EPSCOR as well. And that's certainly a, a life too short. So sending, sending love and light to the colleagues at Santa Fe Community College and his friends and family. So uh, now we've come up on our time to take a break. And I'd like to invite you all to get up and uh, move around, take care of yourself and uh, log back in with us in another uh, five or ten, five or six minutes, and we'll actually get started as promptly at 11.45. So we'll leave this webinar link open, and you are uh, welcome to, to uh, keep it open as well. well. We'll see you on the other side. Thank you. All right, welcome back. Good. Um, we've got more people in the room looking forward to um, our next presenter. Um, I'd like to introduce Andrew Mackey. Um, Andrew, let's see, we're going in the wrong. Andrew. Andrew is the executive vice president and one of the co-founders of Protogen. <clears throat> Excuse me. He has over 20 years of experience in the construction industry performs roles as a general contractor, electrician, estimator, project manager, designer, and field engineer. He has a master's degree in architectural engineering and is a certified measurement and verification professional. 
Um, there's more information in his bio, um, but it's really important for us to share with you all how we will take this information and integrate it into the industry and into workforce. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm, uh, welcome Andy Mackey. Thank you, Andy, for being here. Thank you, Camilla. Um, that was a great introduction. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Andrew Mackey from Protogen, and I'm very happy to be here today to speak on behalf of the ESAMTAC program, Energy Storage and Microgrid Training and Certification. Uh, next, please. So the agenda I want to go through, we've got a lot to cover in a very short amount of time. So the highest level agenda is going to be why eSAMTAC? Why is it here? Why is there an industry need for it? And then what is an eSAMTAC? What does it involve? What content is delivered by the program and what are the outcomes of the program? And then finally, how? How can different organizations and institutions become involved in eSAMTAC and then spread the knowledge across the country? as uh, I think everybody here would agree that we are starting to see a pretty significant need for. Next. So I don't want to dwell too long on the why. I think it's pretty clear that microgrids and energy storage are really taking off almost at an exponential rate. As you can see here in this chart uh, from Navigant, yeah, it's predicted just in the next couple of years that the microgrid need and investments is going to start falling almost an exponential trajectory across the world. Uh, next, please. And then the a subsection of microgrids is battery services. ESAMTAC energy storage is that's the first part. Uh, and energy storage encompasses all sorts of different things from batteries, which are primarily the most common, but you've also got thermal, thermal storage and kinetic storage, uh, hydrogen storage options, et cetera. Uh, and these large grid scale batteries, which we'll kind of focus on here, are used in a multitude of ways across the, the grid for anything from you know, backing up computer centers to allowing the grid to operate in a, smooth, a smoother and more economical manner. Uh, as well as uh, deferring transmission and distribution upgrades when there are constraints on the grid by having localized energy storage that allows them to kind of bump out infrastructure upgrades while still serving the needs of the clients and customers attached to the grid. The chart on the right here you can see is dominated by those blue bars. And this is just kind of a little non sequitur, if you will, or a tangent. But uh, lithium is really starting to take a foothold and there's um, many reasons why that's happening. We're not gonna dwell on it, but I just like to show that the, the lithium implementation is, is really starting to kind of run away with the market. Next. And I think as everybody knows, prices for most electronics, computers, etc are always following a downward trend and that's no different in the uh, battery storage or energy storage market similar to photovoltaics the prices have been driven driven down towards grid parity and then it's predicted in the next 10 years the price of a four-hour battery is going to be hopefully cut in half next To make it a little bit more local, for me, our company is based out of Pennsylvania and we work in the PJM market. Um, and I believe this is an excerpt from the PJM deployments, but what you can see here is the exponential occurring, um, trend already occurring. So if you look at the dates on the x-axis, it really starts that exponential up curve in 2018. And then by just four years, the amount of energy storage uh, connected to the grid is really going to be taking off. Next. Sorry, this, that was the national chart. This is the PJM chart. This is the one that kind of blew me away. So from 2016 to 2019, these are actual connected projects or projects in the queue, um, which means they're awaiting approval uh, for connection to the grid. 
it's grown by 8,600% just in the last three to four years. And I think if anything says that this has arrived, this is a great chart, chart to kind of illustrate that point. Next. Microgrids are relatively complex systems. So in, in industry, throughout industry, there are professionals that specialize in certain aspects, whether it's automatic temperature control and building management systems and automation or PV systems, fuel cell integration, CHP and HVAC integration. The professionals in those segments have committed their careers and all of their bodies of knowledge to understanding the nuances of those specific elements. But a microgrid takes almost all of those elements and incorporates them on every single project. Yeah, there's some small microgrids that don't have everything, but in general, a microgrid is going to be typically more complex and it's gonna require a large uh, system level approach and a system level understanding to make sure that all the components within the system work together and, well, frankly, don't get in the way of each other, which can we found can sometimes happen. So it's important to be able to have a, a holistic understanding of the microgrid systems. Next. Training and certification is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a strong push towards increasing the safety, resiliency, serviceability, and investor confidence on these systems. Um, we don't want it to be the Wild West. Uh, there are people doing research projects that, you know, kind of, they identify the challenges and as you move forward in that progression you identify more safety issues and challenges towards resiliency but in a microgrid project uh, if cash is going to be king because these systems typically need to pencil out so you need to have strong investor confidence and insurance on in place of these systems and a lot of microgrids are installed uh, for resiliency capacity you know if the grid goes down We'll turn our microgrid on, we'll go island mode, and we can keep a hospital up, we can keep a police station up. Or maybe we're just keeping up an industrial process that's going to lose significant amounts of money during downtime. But if your system isn't installed, your microgrid isn't installed to the highest level of craftsmanship, then do you really have a resiliency plan or a resiliency possibility? And we found that a lot of microgrids actually fall short in this if they don't have the full uh, thought out plan from the very beginning in installation by qualified personnel. Next. Uh, this is just a, a brief little example. I don't know how well it's showing up against your screen, but there are some bus bars in there that were installed due to the spacing between the batteries that are too small. Uh, would it work? Yes, but over the long haul, the life of the system would be degraded or degraded, decreased uh, because the, there would be an imbalance on the voltages through the array. And you know, standard uh, practices may not make that overly apparent. Next, please. And then I, I like to kind of harp on, uh, it's a little bit kind of wordplay, but you know, these signs, we've all seen them, authorized personnel, and you've got your safety diamonds. I'll give this project credit, at least there's values in the safety diamonds. Sometimes we don't have those. Uh, and next, please. But that sign says authorized personnel. And then this is one of my all time favorite stock photos where, you know, the, this is from a data center application. And absolutely, these individuals could be authorized to be in that space, but it's probably pretty unlikely that they are qualified based on the level of PPE that they're, well, not wearing. Next. So now let's get into the what. What is ESAM tech? Uh, this is just a little excerpt image from a, an exercise about order of operations, how to, you know, what order are you connecting wires and terminals, which is surprisingly important on uh, battery storage systems. And next, please. So the, the broad overview of eSEMTAC is it's a course developed uh, in order to increase the knowledge and skills uh, with an emphasis on energy storage and microgrid components. 
and it includes uh, a comprehensive examination and then the individuals that go through the course and successfully complete it take the tests within the course they're then able to sit for uh, an independently administered EPRI approved certification which at this point is kind of still forthcoming uh, unfortunately it did get a little delayed with with COVID um, but that EPRI approved cert is definitely in the works next The program itself is broken down into 11 modules. Uh, the first couple modules give you an understanding of the business drivers for the program and for microgrids, uh, and then talks about distributed energy systems kind of as a whole, a 10,000 foot view, what are the components uh, and how are these components used and integrated within uh, microgrid systems. And then through module four, five, um, um, basically module four and five, you really start digging into the unique safety issues around these systems. It's primarily focused on batteries because that's where a lot of the safety nuances are. And then we also go into the DC theory grounding in meters, which you know a lot of so solar programs cover, but solar and batteries and microgrids are they do kind of diverge in, in a couple significant manners and the course aims to you know highlight those differences to make sure the individuals coming through the program uh, are as safe as possible and then the last half of the course is uh, kind of a hands-on understanding of how the connections are made what's important it starts to look at the nuts and bolts of these systems and, and how they're assembled next the ECM TAC program is also accompanied by a, a series of lab activities. Uh, the program itself is primarily designed for electricians and electricians are the first line of installers and troubleshooters of these systems. And it's very important that they get the hands, the hands on experience working with these types of technologies so that they're able to, you know, make all their connections appropriately and have a, a safe environment to make some mistakes that's not going to cause a, a catastrophic failure as well as there's a large portion of PPE selection um, and I think you can see just by a, a high level cursory view of this slide you see PPE show up there quite a few times. Next. Uh, part of the course as mentioned is understanding safety's safety and the the new roles and experiences that individuals working on microgrids and battery storage systems or other energy storage systems would come across and there's some good you know this is a flow chart it's a decision matrix for how to select the ppe you would wear and that's because working in these systems exposes workers to new risks and hazards that they haven't typically come across such as thermal exposures and chemical exposures and how those chemical and thermal exposures are interrelated to the shock and arc flash uh, hazards that they're used to dealing with because not all arc flash clothing is chemical rated. So there, there's some challenges that need to be navigated and uh, we, we aim to provide that understanding. Next. And this is a, a little side example that I think it, it was a great project. So I hate to kind of bring this at, up as an example of what not to do, um, but the batteries they're installing here are sealed gel batteries, which means they're effectively spill proof. So you could argue that these installers are in, over encumbered by PPE that's not necessary. Um, and also maybe they haven't heard of a lift table, which is a, a great piece of equipment that not everybody has seen that can help load batteries. Next. Here's a, another little example of the accumulation of hazards. I think one of the big things for energy storage systems is that they can't be turned off. And that's a, a big difference for typical electrical industry workers. Uh, kind of the first rule of thumb is de-energize everything. Well, when you come into energy storage systems, there are parts of the project that just simply can't be de-energized. And the nuance with energy storage systems that's different from PV is PV is intrinsically current limited. The solar panels can't ever really output more current 
than they're, they're operating at. Batteries are an entirely different story. They can uh, you know, output magnitudes more current than they typically do, and that can become a significant hazard and risk that needs to be mitigated. Next. Uh, here's just a, another example. I, I hate to kind of do the scared straight approach, uh, but you know, sometimes it, it's interesting to see this piece of equipment is a switch for a, um, a battery storage system in a data center. And the two shiny metal bar parts at the bottom are the most negative and the most positive piece of the array. If somebody were to take that cover off and drop it between those connection points, they would have a, a really bad day. This is operating at over 500 volts with multiple thousands of amps available. And there's no fuses or circuit breakers available between there. It would simply keep burning and arcing until there was a catastrophic failure where the metal melted away. Um, so yeah, just a little example of, of kind of the nuances of some of the risks that not everybody sees unless they've had the experience to to see it. Next, please. So this is an excerpt from the training equipment uh, drawing sets that have been developed uh, through the eSAMTAC program. It has a, on the left, a, an AGM battery system, which replicates uh, scalable arrays. So you can do 12, 24, 48 volt arrays over on that left piece of equipment. And then on the right is a seismically certified or a seismically rated um, racking structure for a lead acid wet cell, which allows the students in the course to understand the, how to work safely with battery acid and electrolyte and take specific gravity measurements, et cetera. Next. Uh, once again, this is just an overview of the uh, drawings as part of the lab exercises and the training equipment. Next. And now I want to get into the how. Uh, how do you become involved? Where can you go for this training? How can you offer this training? Next. So there's been um, a development of credentials, or I shouldn't say credentials, but standards around the eSAMTAC program in order to make sure it maintains well, a high level of rigor um, so that um, we can understand that anybody that comes out of an ESAM tech program has the same body of knowledge and is ready to do the same uh, quality of work. So the first piece of that puzzle is the instructor requirements. I'm not gonna go through all of this because I'm sure you can uh, get these slides and, and review it at your own pace or reach out to us, we're, we're happy to share this. But generally uh, instructors, we're looking for people that have been training uh, electrical trade personnel, they're familiar with OSHA and NFPA 70E, they have a basic understanding of the things that they would come across in the microgrid program. And then the real big bullet point here is number three, they'd have to go through a train the trainer program taught by a master instructor. So next. And then the student eligibility requirements. As the eSAMTAC program stands with the current eSAMTAC credential. There, there's other courses that are being developed around the program, but the program now, uh, eSAMTAC as it stands, the part one program is for electricians. So the, the prereq of the course is you are a licensed electrician, or if you're in a local authority that doesn't have licensure, you can get uh, exemptions or, you know, accredited uh, or federal approval effectively. If you're, if you're approved to work in your jurisdiction as an electrician, you qualify. And then the second option is if you're a student in one of those uh, trade training programs. So if you're an apprentice, you can take the ESAM tech course, but you wouldn't get your credential until you became licensed. So you'd kind of be in a probation period. Uh, you'd have the knowledge, you'd take the internal tests uh, within the course, but you wouldn't get your ESAM tax cert uh, until you met all the requirements, which would be uh, licensure. Next. And then finally, the third uh, leg of the authorization stool is the facility. So generally the facility, we 
to offer the program would be an accredited training facility, whether it's community colleges, universities, trade schools, um, you know, union training facilities, anybody that has a, a level of accredited uh, infrastructure for training electricians with a minimum of three years consecutively. And then obviously, of course, that they would have to agree to abide by the, you know, uphold the ESAM TAC agreements. And then, of course, they would have to have the training equipment. And yeah, I think that's that for that. <laughs> Everybody can read. So uh, that was a lot, I know, and I apologize, but we got through it in 20 minutes. And I'd like, now like to open this up for any questions. Andrew, you don't have to uh, apologize for anything. We're really grateful. There's a lot of information there, and I know that it's very helpful um, to a lot of people who are with us today. So if you have questions for Andy in the QA, I can put those out for you all. Any questions specifically? Looks like I covered everything. Well, it takes a minute, <laughs> it takes a minute for people to type in some yeah. questions. And um, I'd also be very interested in hearing what Tomas from the local 611 might um, think. If there are any questions in the Q&A? or in the chat. So Andy, the question, what process is required for getting equipment for the training? Sure, absolutely. Um, hopefully you have my contact information available through the summit. Protogen is the um, licensed supplier of the training equipment. So you would contact us and then we would be more than happy to provide you the order sheets and all the information you would need. Okay, and to have that equipment, so that's assuming that a person has gone through your train the trainer program before the equipment is available, is that how it would work? Uh, I don't believe that there's a, a hard rule that you need to show your cert because we know that people want to work towards this and especially under COVID, uh, there's some challenges with people getting to train the trainers and there is a little bit of a lag between placing an order and getting the equipment. So as long as that you could um, kind of prove to the ESAM TAC organization that you are working towards uh, getting your facility ready to, you know, provide the training, then, then we would definitely work with you on that. Great. Um, another question um, concerning storage. Is there any other type of equipment um, or devices that other than batteries that are available for training? Not through the ESAM TAC program. Um, the, the program was designed for um, a 40 hour course effectively. And it, it's offered, people break it down depending on their institution, whether they're doing night courses or whatever. Um, but it, the industry process that we went through with the stakeholders and the job task analyses identified generally batteries as being the largest safety hazard um, because a lot of other energy storage systems are kind of plug and play where electricians would understand this is our input and this is our output where battery systems often are kind of piecemeal arrays and and uh, that's where a lot of the safety concerns came from so that's what the program currently focuses on great thank you what is the projected employment demand for certified workers um unfortunately i don't have a, a hard number on that because at present there aren't a whole lot of regions that are requiring it um, and that's kind of a chicken or the egg situation, right? You can't demand a certification if there's no labor force for it. Uh, so we wanted to be out in front of that. Um, I can tell you that we are constantly getting calls for people seeking the training. A lot of it's coming from um, equipment OEM providers where they want their field professionals to, to be uh, ready for that. Um, I would say you could kind of look at that as a parallel against those first couple charts I showed though. 
uh, as those as the demand for those systems be to be installed, you know, in, in 20 years or five, 10 years, we're seeing that exponential growth in the systems being installed. Well, we're going to need an exponential growth in qualified personnel as well. And uh, you know, just to what's happening is, you know, there are a lot of qualified electricians in the country. The challenge is a lot of them take on these projects and I don't want to say they get in over their head, but just a little short course can really go a long way to train the existing workforce. You know, you don't have to start from scratch. So along those lines, um, can you talk a little bit about your partnership? We have a question here to speak a little bit about your partnership with IBEW, NECA, and um, the work that you've done with our speaker yesterday, Bernie. Mm -hmm. What are your partnerships with IBEW? Sure. So IBEW was a, um, a contributor to the development. It was also, the program was also done in partnership with Penn State University. It's an open program. Uh, so the, the partnership is very beneficial for all parties and it does not necessarily say that this is for IBEW or NECA contractors only. They just simply kind of picked up the torch for themselves and have been running with it. So they have uh, identified that this is a, a significantly beneficial program and they started to offer it. Uh, but we are also working just the same with, you know, trade schools and community colleges as well. Uh, so, you know, they identified the need and they were willing to support the development. And then ESAM TAC itself is an independent uh, nonprofit 501c3 outside of uh, any of, of those other affiliations. Excellent. Thank you. And Clay Bob Doyle says, um, as we begin deploying ES systems in our substations, this training will be essential. So it's a comment that it's timely and that they're grateful. Mm -hmm. And then um, we have uh, Jim um, who is saying, oh, it's, could you talk about the difference between the NAB CEP certification and the um, ASEM TAC? Yeah, absolutely. So NABCEP is a uh, solar only credential. I, I believe I, I have a NABCEP, I carried a NABCEP, um, and it, it was directly focused on the, NABCEP has a, a lot of different um, paths now, whether you do installer or sales or designer, et cetera. Um, but I would say NABCEP is, if anything, just complementary to ESAMTAC. It, it talks a lot about the solar piece, whereas ESAMTAC incorporates solar as merely a small fraction of the content and you know a large part of distributed uh, energy systems or uh, microgrids are going to implement renewable energy sources which would largely be solar um, but they they are they're complementary but they're definitely independent and as somebody who's had both and has worked on eSAMTAC I would say that there's absolutely no reason to pursue, to not pursue both. Um, they're both very valuable. Excellent, thank you, Andy. Are there any other questions for Andrew? Super grateful to have you uh, with Great. us today. It's the kind of thing that makes these virtual summits um, maybe a little easier than the regular. No travel involved. <laughs> right. Excellent stellar presentation from you. And it's really nice to, to actually see you. We've been on the phone for a few rounds and uh, yep. really happy to have you here. So thank you very much, Andy. Great, thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right. Um, well, let's, let's see where we are in our agenda. We're at the end of our morning. We're at the end of our, our summit. I think we've had a very successful summit. Um, right now, we wanna prompt you to um, follow the instructions. You're gonna type in two or three words that are your most important takeaway from the summit. So I want you to think a little bit about this. Again, everyone who's been here, who was invited, has something to uh, contribute to bring microgrid, smart grid um, to our, our state. So now on the screen that's provided to you, you're gonna type in two or three words, just the words, just a words themselves, not necessarily full sentences, not full sentences, just 
words that are your most important takeaways from the summit. We're going to create a word cloud. So this oh, is Camilla, let me just jump in here and let folks know there's two ways that you can do this. You can uh, text using your cell phone. You're going to text wise planet 683 to that number 37607 or you can surf over to uh, pollev.com slash wiseplanet683 and to enter in your uh, responses. So we'll in, invite folks to uh, go ahead and, and get navigate over the whichever way works best for you. And um, we can uh, be watching those as, as Camilla is doing, doing our, our wrap up comments. So if I, so I just wanna say this again. So if you say I put in 237607. And so that, I, that's who you're going to text to. Okay. And then text the, the word wise planet 683 and that'll enable your phone to, to be able to, to type in those. And it looks like we're, we're getting some answers in. Excellent. So um, this is fun to watch. <laughs> Oh, look at this. So as we're watching all everybody's answers come in, I want to I want to yeah. thank our speakers today and thank everybody who's participated. This is really super exciting and we're we're so pleased that you were able to join us for these two days. But I'll, I'll toss it back to, to Camilla because you you can uh, tell us about what you're seeing here on the screen. Well, it's exciting. So I, I did pause out and I think Selena's used to staring at a word cloud a little more than I am and watching these words grow. But I, I definitely, we have to absolutely thank everyone who's made this possible. Um, I have to also thank our, our technical crew um, but Brittany and um, Selena and absolutely um, the good work that was done on our, our video team and um, microgrid systems lab MSL David Breaker assured us this this was scheduled to happen in the spring and we weren't able to have it in the spring next thing you knew we were all in lockdown with COVID it was a issue of delay or jump on it and do a virtual summit and though we started in June um, David Breaker assured us that time was gonna go by quickly. So I really have to acknowledge uh, the Microgrid Systems Laboratory, the collaborations that um, that organization brings. It's really about partnerships. It's about integration of the different entities that have Microgrid um, as a priority from a different area. So this is for primarily undergraduate institutions um, for the industry and how we collaborate and team up to create the workforce. And everyone who's been in this um, was identified either by someone on our active team or um, by Microgrid Systems Laboratory. So I have to, to say thank you to David Breaker. And as we watch this grow, um, we have also some uh, gratitude completely to uh, Bill Michener, to Ann Jekyll, and Selena, um, everyone with EPSCoR. Um, as with our Economic Development Administration um, partners who made it possible to have that incredible equipment that you saw um, in our videos. So um, as you see this growing and everyone is looking at the word cloud, you also should have a poll that popped up um, on your screen where you are able to vote, your next steps are, and um, when you have a chance, go ahead and indicate for the day two poll what your next steps are. You will also be receiving an assessment, an evaluation for the um, summit, and we'd very much appreciate your input um, regarding the summit, what you saw that worked for you, what you saw that you, or what you didn't see, you know, what could be more helpful. We have um, additional summits planned 
and we want to hear from you to see what we can do to make sure that these are valuable. We're definitely looking for a, um, a way to expand our capabilities statewide. So we look at the um, poll results. Um, your first, your next steps, talk to your colleagues. We had 53% um, at your institution. That's great to hear. Get more information at 47%. Um, share videos and other resources. Um, to follow up on that, the slides based on permission from the speakers will be made available um, to everyone, as well as um, the videos will be available online. And um, consider integrating topics into your courses. We have 13% there, and we see that 20% will follow up with the context the contacts that you have made here in the summit. Um, short of not being able to meet over the, the coffee and the donuts, um, I hope that we will, um, all of us, go back to the lists of the participants and uh, get to know some of our folks, um, everyone better. So um, we will be distributing the contact list and you feel free to reach out to each other and work together and do not hesitate to contact, contact us at Santa Fe Community College for anything that you may need. And at this point, I would just really love for everyone who's um, in the summit to um, open their cameras so we can see everyone. And um, uh, Camilla, we can't do that <laughs> in this app. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, we can't. Okay. Um, uh, no. <laughs> no worries. I was really hoping we could see everyone um, who's still here, but I will just say thank you all for your attendance. Um, we look forward to seeing you again. We look forward to working with you in the future to assure um, that we have a strong New Mexico-based workforce in um, our distributed energy technologies. And thank you all again for being here. Thank you for your good work. Goodbye.